chairing the panel, Carlos Martinez, our technology expert. Carlos Eduardo Chad, director de Asuntos Internacionales de Aprend, Asociación de Profesionales y Entidades en Nuevas Tecnologías. Elaine Izquierdo, Satellite Business Manager y Commercial Manager en UFINET. Alejandro Guerra Najar, VP de Ventas Latam y Caribe de Utelsat OneWeb. Caribe. Satelital. So the purpose of this panel is to discuss Internet Satellite Access, one of the main protagonists in the rapid expansion and accessibility of Internet connectivity. We'll review the development of these applications in the space that they have occupied in this progress, in this progress and we will cast a view to the future of this recent technological development. Carlos, you have the floor. Thank you, Cesar. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. I always like to tell a story and those who know me are aware of this. And yesterday I was thinking, why was I so enthusiastic about speaking about satellites? I assume that all those of us who are involved in technology when we were small, we always thought of becoming astronauts or pilots. So take this as a kind of trip to the past and to look up looking up into the skies and to understand why are we speaking about satellites again when i started working for the internet back in 1998 the only internet connection we had was a satellite connection these were the satellites with the earth stations that were very big with synchronous satellites and that time we already complained that 500 milliseconds was such a long time for sending and receiving packets and very soon after that three or four years after that as we, we started to forget about satellites because started using submarine cables submarine cables had a series of advantages they lowered the latency radically the price per megabit was much cheaper and it continued to drop and we forgot all about satellites and those of us who work here people who have been working on satellites for a long time of course did not forget this Except for very specific applications, we stopped using satellites. Now, four or five years ago, we started to speak once again about satellites. And I think this is most interesting. That is why we were most enthusiastic and lightning staff about organizing an activity such as this. And this is a sort of continuation on the panel we had on submarine cables in Fortaleza we considered speaking about the main forms we have of building the internet. So I will now, we have four questions and we will start giving the floors to the members of the panels. Thank you for joining us today and for coming to Panama. So the first question we have is how have satellites in the industry evolved over the last 10 to 15 years, and what are the key aspects or that have marked a difference in this evolution? Carlos Chab, you have the floor first. Thank you, Carlos. I disagree with you in what you said regarding satellites. Even geostationary satellites are sort of out of fashion. And of course, I have been working for a number of years in the satellite industry industry and they still are present because of the features these satellites have. And all this began back in the 40s and when we heard about 2001, that movie, what I think they might have been flying objects at certain heights and no energy had to be supplied. And with three devices, with three repeating devices, a global connection could be achieved. In the 60s, this technology was made possible. We started with the first satellites, the Telstars, and after that, the intergovernmental organization was created, Intelsat, where all, where all the nations were not only part of this, but invested money. This 
then led to others like Inmarsat, which is specialized in maritime activities, but in also mobile activities, well, with geostationary satellites. And these appear to be fixed in the space. But afterwards, later on, when Carlos Martinez comes up in the technical universe, we started seeing other types of configurations, such as EOs, medium Earth orbit satellites, which have a better latency, but not that good. And they have a poorer coverage. The advantage of the GEOs is that you can have a global coverage, and that's not bad. For television, for example, that's excellent. We want to see the Pope, F1 race, or any other event. So we reach this constellation in this uh, century with the LEO satellites, which provide a latency that is very similar to the submarine cables and the possibility of connecting to the internet and many more things. In this graph here, you can see that the interesting thing is that the lower the orbit, the better the efficiency. More megabits. And let us go on to the next slide, and we can see the large frequencies that they use. Let us focus on three. We have the L band, the S band, the X band used for military purposes, but let us focus on the C band, which was the first one, and the KU band and the K band. The C band is what all the you, those uh, that are my age use this, uh, this 6.2 gigahertz and they have a very good coverage because they provide a great opening and a great possibility of having the major footprint. And it is almost immune to the effect of rain with the KU band, which has 11.7 to 14.5 gigahertz. They have the major issue of being affected, strongly affected by rain, but provides a far better bandwidth. And, for example, in the case of a province or small areas, and then we have the KA band where you see the deployment. These are enormous amounts of megahertz, which allow me to have a lot, a very high speeds, many megabits per seconds, and with the new beams, this allows us to provide the shape we wish, and it enables something even better to look at the different frequencies. Alejandro was speaking about the high performance satellites, the HPSs, but you have to pay for that. And you pay for that because of the way they are affected by rain. Alejandro. Hello, Carlos, and thank you for allow me to be here. Thank you, Lechnik, for your invitation. Also, thanking, thank you for sharing this panel with us. I would answer this question from the standpoint of a satellite operator. If you allow me, I'd like to refer to a world of bits per second. And now with these constellations, we have the very high throughput satellites, which we can reach one terabit of capacity. So in this from the standpoint of the capacity and the technological development, we have now been able to provide much greater coverage in the globe. Another major change in the construction of the satellites is that we've gone from chemical propulsion systems to uh, uh, the majority of the satellites are all electric now. So this gives us an even greater longevity to the satellites. now. The multi-orbit development has been making progress in the past years. Although it is quite true that the LEOs, because of the proximity to Earth and the telemetry options, like Carlos was saying, and the mobility in satellite telephony, we now have major constellations, and some are yet to come with a capacity that is very big in terms of connectivity. Another substantial change I would say, has to do with the satellite interconnection. Today, we have all these optical developments, and we no longer need to come to the Earth, to the gateways to achieve connection. So at level of space, there is a connection of about one terabit. We 
know that this is part of the growth we have had as an industry. Now, maybe less relevant but equally important are the new business models. Like Carlo was saying many years ago, we had operations, clear channel connections, but now we have access to the satellite in different times and frequencies and types. We can reuse the spectral resources and be far more competitive from the standpoint of the cost per megabit. And like you said in the introduction, it's not only about submarine cables and optic fiber that had led to a drastic reduction in cost, but this is also something we see in the case of satellites. So reusing frequencies and much smaller beams with coverages of up to 200 kilometers in diameter allows us to use frequencies and be far more efficient from the standpoint of the spectrum, thus reducing costs and achieving also the possibility of having other applications. Now, this has posed a major transformation to the industry of satellite communications. So we have also the vendors. And I now give the floor to Elaine so she can tell us about the development over the past decade or two, but in the from the standpoint of the operators of these services, which are ultimately those that provide connectivity to users. Thank you. Thank you, LACNIC, for the invitation. And as locals, I would like to welcome you to my country, those of you who are not locals, and I hope you enjoy your stay here. As Alejandro said, I'm going to speak from the standpoint as an operator user of this satellite capacity over the past 20 years. There have been quite a number of changes in these technologies. And this is not only from the standpoint of the satellites, but also from the standpoint of the platforms. So the Earth stations, in the Earth stations that accept the satellite capacity, this has improved the efficiency, the economic efficiency, and has led to making this technology more affordable and to provide access in areas that are not so easily accessed. The satellite standard has also changed. Initially, it was UBS, but we then evolved to S2, which brought about changes. So in other words, the number of megahertz was then evolved to megabits, so more could be obtained. And at the beginning of the, around 2010, a new standard, LEB2X. So compared to the first standard, this has three times the satellite capacity using the same amount of megahertz. Like Carlos was saying, Initially, we thought about the C-band, which is quite robust. And over time, other bands have stepped in and began to operate, and improvements were made from the technological standpoint regarding their efficiency. We have the KU-band. 15 years ago, we never imagined that this could be used in places such as Panama, where there is a lot of rain and forests. But technology has evolved so much that there are mechanisms to optimize the modulations so that the communication of the satellites, the ground station, can be made without having major signal losses. Then we have the Ka band, which are the highest frequencies with higher throughput. And in recent years, the high throughput satellites, the HPSs, and recently the low orbit satellites, the LEO. In addition to that, this supports the economic uh, options. So 
launching the satellites is not as expensive as this was 20 years ago. Uh, we hadn't referred to that this last point, and that's very, very important. I guess you saw those videos of SpaceX when they land. It's quite amazing. We miss that. Well, I have another question. As a matter of fact, uh, you mentioned some of the issues, but maybe we could focus on talking about the low orbit satellites. Uh, how do you view this? How do they work? Well, it's uh, it, to learn. Uh, we'd like to learn how they work and what is uh, the role that they have in uh, the provision of Internet services, Alejandro? Thank you. Yes, I have the task of being the first to explain how the low orbit satellites work. Well, let's see. Oh, there's an animation that will show us how these mega constellations are built. Leo operates, as we saw, in the between from 600 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers from Earth. Most of them are polar. Uh, constellations, some of them are elliptic, and uh, um, it's better to understand it. It, it. It's like a mobile network, but here it's not uh, the mobiles that uh, move, but the satellites. They orbit from north to south and from south to north. They are in talk, in talk, um, they are in the different planes, and they have a full global c coverage, and they change as the satellite transits the area of observation of a terminal unit. I think that that is uh, the main characteristic. The second thing that I could rescue about this is that architecture became a bit more complex. We are going to um, have a, uh, if we want a synchrony in signals, um, as the satellite um, transits from north to south or south to north, depending on the trajectory, each uh, of uh, the signals will land in a gateway that will be around the globe. Uh, the the if uh, the um, our constellation is far, then uh, the gateway is going to be uh, further on, and uh, we have a different gateways of or repeaters along with those coverages, and uh, basically they will be in a horizontal line vis-a-vis uh, -vis Greenwich. So I think that that is one of the main characteristics. Just uh, for the sake of statistics, a terminal unit in a constellation of 2,000 kilometers, such as one way, observes the uh, satellite from two to three minutes. That is that um, in a day, the unit will contact multiple satellites, maybe 50 satellites to guarantee connectivity. Another important characteristic is the proposal of low latency, as was mentioned earlier, trying to approach that uh, experience of fiber optic of the submarine cables in data transmission. And it's very fashionable today because, as we, you mentioned, because of the capacity that the industry has today of launching multiple satellites in the same rocket and manufacturing a million dollar uh, satellites in the past, they cost half a million. So that difference has helped us evolve and have a greater capacity. Our constellation, one web, as one terabit uh, per second. There are others, well, and maybe in the future, Carlos will mention that, that they may reach 10 terabits or even 10 terabits of capacity. The important thing is that we go from tens of uh, satellites to thousands of satellites, maybe at uh, the um, ITU uh, unit in uh, Wikipedia will show that there are over 10,000 constellations that will be uh, um, in constellations uh, around the globe. Alejandro explained very well how it works. And really, the analogy that he used uh, comparing the satellites with uh, the radio bases of mobile phones. That's perfect because um, 
as a user, you move from one cell to another, from one radio base to another, but here it's the satellite that moves. And now, right now, you are connected to a satellite uh, terminal, LEO, and as Alejandro said, in one single day, you may have been having access to the internet thanks to 50 satellites that have hovered over uh, where you are. Now, as a user and operator, I w I'd like to highlight how easy it is to install these terminals, which is not the case of geostationary satellites where the technology to access internet is a VSAT where you have your dish the size of one meter, 1.2 meters in uh, diameter is the uh, I do, the uh, R do, the um, Here, these are smaller antennas, uh, less than a meter. They are flat panel antennas. And they do the self pointing and they move to get a better view line toward the satellite. So, in addition to the fact that it's cheaper, much cheaper than in the past. This technology is quite simple. It, it enables a mass uh, deployment of uh, these technologies. Mm -hmm. Carlos, well, I'm going to give a bit of publicity or to talk about some of the characteristics of the best known uh, networks. The Starlink satellites. I'm also going to talk about OneWeb. Um, although the representative is here, and the future Quipper constellation, that's Amazon's. So let's start with Quipper. That um, was uh, thought to have about uh, 3,200 satellites at the end of their shelf life. They are still being deployed, uh, developed about 350 kilometers in height, uh, some say a bit more than we see in practice, uh, the real distance. And we are in tenths of milliseconds of latency. Here they discuss the latency. That's one of the most important things. And there are applications in which unless you have a very low latency, they are useless. Financial transactions and that uh, would be unthinkable unless you have uh, if you have uh, long latencies the the they use uh, k band connectivity that gives uh, many possibilities and they say there will be three types of terminals one is a bit larger than a kindle and we we are always speaking of end users with a uh, latency will be about 50 milliseconds the second option is a larger to, um, uh, uh, station a size of a pizza box with 300 400 megabits per second and then a professional antenna the size of a small desk that would enable me to have a terabit so those would be uh, uh, that would be used for back old and cellular phones uh, uh, and then the Starlink satellites operate in the KU um, band. There you can see the constellations of the satellites and we'll see afterwards uh, how they're projected on Earth. By the end of the deployment, we'll, they will have 11,000 satellites, 550 kilometers uh, uh, distance from Earth and a latency of several tenths of milliseconds. Uh, they can reach 100, but in the lower orbit, they can reach uh, much less than that. And also, in this case, the antenna is small, the size of a pizza box, too. <laughs> and let me give you a practical example. Until a few days ago, it was not being marketed in Argentina. I went to ask in uh, uh, an appliance, a home appliance uh, store, and I asked, and they said, well, you, it's coming and you can hire it. Uh, and how much does it cost? Well, the terminal costs about $500, and the monthly fee, fee $70. That is in relative uh, prices because they couldn't insure it until they 
close all the commercial agreements. And it's interesting because the use in remote places is, it's uh, there's nothing like it in rural areas in the mountains. You can't deploy anything but satellites. So, well, that would be very tight. I think that the one web aspect was already discussed by Alejandro. So let's stop this here. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Well, the third question. Well, we're doing well with time. What would be the characteristics, any of you, the most uh, outstanding uh, views of the satellite networks in Latin America at present? We start with you, Elaine. Well, the advantages of implementing a satellite solution in Latin America. Well, and from here, here I'm going to use a presentation that we are, uh, have. Uh, well, let me tell you how our continent is doing in geographical terms, how it's configured. We can configure point multiple point system from a ground station uh, that we have here in Panama and using these, yeah, making the most of a satellite beam, you can have a great uh, network using one single platform. and. For instance, for teleeducation services, you can also send multicast information and information you may want from a central site to several sites where they're going to uh, use the same contents. You can do that thanks to our, uh, our continent. And these are uh, quite rapid implementations as uh, satellite. Uh, when, when you reach the site, it can take you about four hours between the, since you install the dish and you configure the uh, modem and then you have a satellite connection. And also, uh, with low investment, it's less than $2,000. That would be relatively inexpensive if you compare it to installing a tower in a very rural area in a mountainous area or implementing a fiber optic service where you have to deploy several kilometers of fiber and then uh, the maintenance of that uh, rural fiber optic and in addition it's reliable it's a reliable service. The center side from where the signal comes, it's the stratosphere, and it is very unlikely for anything to happen. <clears throat> so uh, you're not to expect uh, downtimes. In, and in addition, among the most uh, demanded services are telemedicine services for <clears throat> uh, remote hospitals and uh, um, <clears throat> health centers and medical care centers. During the pandemic, these services were uh, highly demanded because people couldn't uh, move or go to schools or the medical centers for visits. And also there for a, a cellular backhaul, there are uh, indigenous communities where the only way um, mobile phone uh, uh, operator can provide services in these regions may be through the transmission through a satellite antenna. It is also, well, recently, there's been a great demand in our regions, the hotspots, um, to massify the internet access in rural areas in our region. Carlos? Yes, thank you, Carlos. The original question was what are the characteristics of satellite uh, connectivity in the region. First, we have to talk of the region. The region is vast and it has characteristics where you have mountainous areas of difficult access, uh, sierras, uh, mountain ranges of difficult and insular um, uh, areas where it's very difficult uh, to uh, deploy them and uh, huge deserts of Patagonia that is shared with Chile and uh, the jungles that are very dense like uh, the Amazonas and uh, the uh, um, 
the Amazons that uh, you see in the north of uh, Latin America. So the uh, land deployment is very difficult, but there's another essential characteristics in addition to how easy it is to deploy it, but it's the resilience of the satellite systems when there are earthquakes or tsunamis. Uh, uh, remember the case uh, of uh, uh, an earthquake there was in Chile in 2010 in the summer, and there was uh, a cut in the services. Um, the people complained about not having communications, not so much uh, for power, but it was more important to have connections. So, um, although they wanted to know how the people were in uh, the neighboring town or how, you know how their families were. And as Elaine just pointed out, you can go with the terminals and very quickly reestablish re a very reliable uh, um, connections and very quickly. So this is an essential characteristic that is not offered by land uh, deployments, uh, terrestrial deployments. So we have to encourage the deployment of satellite networks. I'm going to tell you the case of my country with a regulatory framework in Argentina is a bit uh, obsolete. It's rather old. It's a geostationary satellite was uh, uh, written for uh, the late uh, in the last century in 1999 curiously enough the regulatory framework of the uh, non geostationary satellites is 1995 in 30 years technology and the people's needs and uh, the possibility of accessing services ha has uh, absolutely been upended in argentina there's been a change in policies and with a new government that took over in december going from a uh, rather restrictive policy with satellites to a policy of open skies as described by Millet. at present Millet is meeting uh, um uh, musk uh, discussing that precisely. Thank you, Carlos. Alejandro. Well, well, what Elaine and Carlos were saying, and I like regarding what Alejandro said in his introduction, is that we have 20, almost 30 countries in Latin America. We have many, many islands two major forests in the Darien and the Amazon, like Carlos was saying. And I think that the most relevant applications in Latin America from this standpoint have to do with mobility and the inclusion and digital divide issues. And when I speak about connectivity, I'm speaking about mobility. So about 30% of our income as a company come from in-flight connectivity. Today we have the possibility of providing coverage, internet coverage in airplanes, initially also in cruise ships and in cargo ships. Everything that provides connectivity for in, in, uh, movement, microbuses, trains, and the maritime area is something that is not taken advantage of. 5% of airplanes that provide services have internet connectivity. So this is a major opportunity for us as operators. There are not many more ways of providing connectivity to airplanes, and it happens with vessels. Ameri the Americas are no exception. Many of you travel from other countries. You traveled by play, plane and you had connectivity and that's possible thanks to satellite internet access in the social inclusion programs we have participated in many activities panama had a major program and ecuador too regarding public policies to provide connectivity and also the largest number of terminals is by far Mexico and Colombia, uh, Peru, there about 50,000 to 100,000 satellite stations have been deployed to close the digital divide. There we have we have hard work that still has to be done by the governments in order to provide penetration. These are the two most relevant sources for us. Carlos, I think you wanted to add something. Yes, this is a practical example. 
um, can we have the video on the Starlink satellites? This is a guided tour. It's a very short video clip. And this is how you can imagine when the, you view the satellites, and this is what happens in practice. This was seen at the Ezeiza International Airport. And you can see the satellite leaks going by. These are no UFOs, but this is the reflection of the light on these satellites. And it's quite interesting because you see these, in fact, they are at a height where it is possible to see them with the naked eye. And there was a rebound because the scientists complain bitterly that this affects when they look at the galaxies with the telescopes. So it would be desirable to have satellites at a different height. Thank you. So we have made quite an interesting review of what of the past and the present and how things work. And we now have the most philosophical question, the one that sort of is about dreaming. This is like the crystal ball, like Elaine was saying. And what are, in your opinion, the emerging trends in satellite connectivity? How do you view the satellite industry in the next 10 years? Uh, thank you, Carlos, and thank you for giving me the opportunity of telling you about this crystal ball and what the satellite market will look like. And the most difficult thing is what people will need. The offer is quite clear. Uh, we will continue with the deployment of all the networks that are now in the midst of being deployed. But there is a feature that has not been mentioned. A geostationary satellite has a life of, of at least 15 years, a low orbit satellite, because they are at a level where there is air resistance at that level of the at height in the atmosphere. So the life of that LEO satellite is third, a third of the time. So this not only has to do with deployment, but also replacing the deployments that are coming to the end of that life. So it's not about changing the satellites, but we also have to improve the processing speed. This will lead to decreasing the latency, reusing frequency with smaller antennae. And then we have the new constellations. Will we have new satellite constellations? Can anyone answer? I asked the ITU, and they said that the, from the standpoint of interference, there's still room for three and a half constellations of LEO satellites. And I re-asked, how can I add half a constellation? Well, I was about to ask the same thing. What is half a constellation? Well, we don't know what it is. I, the ITU did not answer. But this is only from the standpoint of potential interferences. I don't go to into the power flow or interference or other things which are more technical. but. As representatives of Intelsat, Alejandro is well aware of this. This involves intensive investment. So therefore, this is not so easy, namely adding new constellations. And we have to see if this is at all feasible in the market. Now, I think of a couple of other topics. For example, the increased use of IoT, the Internet of Things. So. LEO satellites are ideally made for this because with cheap terminals, small terminals, and at low speed, this is just perfect to develop things such as those. The IoT today has a lot of terrestrial networks. and. If it, it is ubiquitous, it can be seen from everywhere. And there are, there are other things like Alejandra mentioned, which is electric propulsion, optical communications. We're not speaking about new frequency bands that are way beyond this. And these provide optical communication speeds. So we have a future where we'll have more satellites in numbers. I don't know whether constellations and many more megabits per second. Alejandro. Alejandro, 
Yes, this is a very interesting question. I also wanted to have the crystal ball that Elaine mentioned. Now, there are many challenges. I think satellite technology has evolved a lot in the past decade, even much more than in the past 40 years. And this is what happens with the Earth. Here, as, a human, as humanity, we have made progress, we have Major, we have made major advances. Now, the first challenge we face is that of convergence and consolidation. If you allow me, I will explain what these mean. Consolidation is that as an industry, I would say that about two years ago, there were 10 satellite operators, and today, those from those 10, there were six, and the two largest ones are merging. So I think that what we have ahead is yet another turn, and we might end up being four. We have companies that in the past did not invest in this market that involves space, like SpaceX, with its capital venture of Starlings and Amazon, which in the past was in a totally different market and are now starting to invest quite a lot, many billions of dollars in these constellations. And those, that is like uh, good news as an industry will be evolving much faster in order to respond to the market demands of consolidations. Then we have the technological progress and convergence. And I'd like to mention two things in the context of convergence. The first is that video and IP will be following the same path. We all have video on demand with the OTT platforms compared to live video. And I think this will evolve in the coming years and in the coming decades as you we're asking your question. There is also a synergy for us as operators with assets in the space and the land operators. We saw in the diagrams that we'll be increasingly need interconnection to the gateways where these signals of the mega constellations will be landed through MPLS networks or those optic, fiber optic networks. This will help us as operators to improve the user experience and deliver a higher value service. And my final comment is that I agree with that more megabits, more technology on the earth. But the major challenge we have as an industry is to evolve in the business model. Connectivity as such will disappear. It will be like breathing or like water. I think we're going to look at the different value layers. So these scenarios are very important. There are business opportunities in the coming 10 years for all those of us who are here in this forum, namely adding a lot of value to connectivity regardless of whether this is satellite, land, or whatever. So this integration is essential and will become most relevant in the coming years. Elaine? Thank you. Adding on to what Alejandro was telling us and regarding the future, there will be a greater integration of the LEO satellites with the Earth networks. This will then reflect it in greater flexibility. These could be data networks for a bank where these would be hybrid solutions between LEO satellites and land optic fiber networks, for example, MPLS, and then to be developed custom-made services using these technologies. Furthermore, as Carlos was saying, within five years, the current constellation of Starlink would be would have to be replaced because the life of these satellites is about five years parallel to that. The other two constellations that are being developed at present, which is as Amazon Kuiper and OneWeb, would be fully deployed from here until five years. So we have more taste, more flavors to choose from when you decide what application you will be using. 
Additionally, technological developments that are then reflected in more megabits for the hertz that one is configuring more spectral efficiency. And in addition to that, something that I think is wonderful, which is being developed right now, is satellite to phone, which is literally having a radio base with the LEO satellites in order to provide connectivity in rural areas, for example, to send text messages, to uh, 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 make calls for help, or also to have satellite in your mobile phone where you are in mountainous areas and there is no connectivity. In addition to that, we'll continue having the geo satellites. Hopefully, it will continue to exist because LEO is no competition to the GEO satellites. This is just uh, something that complements this, that supplements this. That is how I view the future. So different tools for different applications and uses. Thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed this. I've had set very high expectations on this session. We now have time for questions. We are doing wonderfully with time. Let me remind you that you have microphones in the aisles. You can go up to the microphones. And while people get ready to do so, I'd like to open the floor to any of the members of the panels if you wish to make a final re uh, re I do dare. Well, obviously, I wanted to thank this uh, invitation to the online participants and the people in the forum uh, to send questions. I feel passionate about this. I could spend a couple of hours more talking about the future of satellite communications and what uh, uh, is to be done. May my last uh, reflection, I think that we need synergy. Uh, I think that this is my take-home message. This space is very important because if you realize we have uh, an added value operator, a consultant that has uh, dealt with all the regulatory framework and the public policy in each government, how the pieces fit in the puzzle to uh, make it viable from uh, to, to market these services from the regulatory and legal part. And from our side, the operators that have a long-standing trajectory in the market and uh, that uh, um, give services in the market through their dealers. And I think that we have an opportunity to have synergy with other um, um, uh, stakeholders in the field of communications and IT. There, um, AI will play a, a key role. In Washington, we saw that the new technological development of the platforms will be cloud-based. That is absolutely disruptive. We'll no longer have the clusters and uh, uh, these big uh, teleports. So there's a great opportunity for vendors of uh, server and software um, vendors that was in, were not uh, integrated uh, as playing a role in telecommunications. And finally, as I pointed out, connectivity between our radio transmitters and the technological development at a spatial level. That implies a great opportunity for various stakeholders in our industry in the forum. I think this, this would be my last message to synergize between these different opportunities that are coming in future years and be paying close attention because of this opportunity that we'll have for improvement as a society, as Latin Americans, to reduce the digital divides. This is just uh, food for thought. I think we have questions. I, I admit I don't see anything at all from here. Well, I thought it was Tomas, but I wasn't sure. I just saw his silhouette. Guilty. Thomas Lynch, uh, please, a second. When you ask questions, please say who you are and uh, say whether the question is for a panelist or if it's for anybody. Thomas Lynch. A person with a satellite uh, past. You speak. You t said that the uh, that the turnover of low orbit satellites is every five years, and we imagine from here to 50 years, uh, all the satellites crashing against each other. Please, could you um, 
Tell me about it. Yes, that might be true. At the geostationary satellite time, there they said, well, but there's only one orbit and uh, the satellites will clash. Well, at 36,000 uh, kilometers, the arc is uh, 750 kilometers. So the distance is uh, much smaller at lower orbits. But um, the this w spatial waste have a, a great chance of uh, entering the atmosphere and burning and disappearing. Still, there is a possibility, always. I don't know about you, but I think in these many years of satellite uh, life, I never heard of any ac accidents or, or crashes uh, or uh, at least with sat communication satellites. I don't know, maybe, can you say whether in practice you've seen uh, problems like this? Well, let me expand this information. From the geostationary point of view, as Carlos said, uh, a collision between satellites is highly unlikely, and the orbit positions are already assigned, and they depend on each country's sovereignty and these orbit uh, positions were attributed. I think that there the turnover is in a, in a couple of decades with the thermoelectric. We have a 20, 25 year lives. Uh, uh, and in Leo, as Carlos said, when a satellite fails, the propulsion system uh, makes it enter in the atmosphere and it gets disintegrated. That is the eco-friendliness of, echo of the low orbit constellations. There are, maybe I didn't explain it, but in the animation you saw that there are backup uh, satellites that uh, will uh, solve the failures of of each of the rings. So if the satellite fails, it enters uh, the atmosphere and one of the backup uh, satellites uh, replaces its position in uh, the beehive to guarantee coverage. So we went from tenths or hundredths to thousands of satellites. So indeed, you have many more satellites in space. However, the space is still too large and they won't be uh, orbiting so close to each other. And the heights in each constellation will make it possible for us to operate in a coordinated manner to prevent those situations happening. Thank you. The next, did you want to answer that uh, here? So there is, we have somebody else with a satellite past, Alejandro Costa of the staff of LACNIC. Yes, I think that Tomas spoke of the future. I do think that sooner or later they will collision. Now, my question is to the large number of satellite operators in the region, companies that have invested millions of dollars in teleports and satellite hubs, and apparently they will die because of the large operators that are coming offering uh, decently uh, uh, inexpensive uh, services. So what do you think that uh, those, uh, what will happen with those operators in the future? Well, I think that yes, they may die. Well, as we said in one of the questions, Leo is a compliment. It is not meant to be a direct uh, competition to what is already available in the teleports or geostationary satellites. Maybe in 10, 15 years, we could uh, reevaluate this, but at present, the LEO uh, networks are for, uh, uh, for internet uh, apps and what is implemented at present, but for corporate networks, uh, custom-made services where you have to do a very specific routing for a customer. We haven't reached uh, that moment uh, um, to uh, use exclusively the LEO satellites. Let me add something very small. Well, the question is very good. And this is not the first time I hear it in events of this kind. I would say two things. I think that it is true that these operators have added value services with teleports, with platforms, everything you mentioned will have a space. I think it will be reduced. Um, 
I think that Leo's came up with a, a value proposal of massifying the product. So the degree of specialization of the partners or integrators of added value services, the market is going to be reduced because the apps or the end users that are very sensitive to cost will choose an, a cheaper alternative. I think that, as I mentioned earlier, the evolution of these operators to add multiple layers of added value over the connectivity services, if they transform as organizations and they can incorporate those dynamics, they will survive. They won't be killed by Leo. However, very large companies are coming, and I agree with you that there's a great threat from the the point of view of a large company competing against a small one with all the scale economies they may have. That would be my first comment. But there's also an opportunity. Although it is true that the one web services are not marketed uh, by, through a web page and we don't have the fee, the rates and uh, the plans, our involvement is indirect. As a matter of a fact, we better for the added value um, service providers and we only work through Finet uh, and uh, these small operators or larger operators with a regional footprint. So there's an opportunity for these operators to approach each constellation, at least from our side, we are absolutely open to work with each uh, of you for specific projects for specific regions or to provide services for specific applications that's my contribution thank you we have another question go ahead thank you good morning i'm mendoza my question is for carlos eduardo and this um, I'd like to know the philosophy or the approach of the regulatory, the government regulatory bodies to see, uh, to block the uh, services of data or whatever that coming through satellites and what is their intention by uh, giving protection. I think that specifically in the case of Argentina, now it's opened and we saw the same in El Salvador and I don't know the uh, potential uh, tendency for the development of satellite services, not so much for operators, but for the end users. Thank you for your question. That's very interesting. I'm just going to speak uh, of Argentina, but I know that the situation is similar in other countries. In Argentina, there used to be one satellite operator. They developed two generations, set one and set two. Uh, those They replaced uh, the other satellites. And there was a certain apprehension in government. There was a, system, a regulatory system providing a reciprocity framework. They allowed uh, in only the countries that uh, had a satellite agreement uh, and and uh, for countries that would allow the Argentine satellite in for instance with uh, in uh, Europe no, we couldn't enter Europe. So there was a certain restriction that was not included in the regulatory framework. The regulatory framework only mentioned reciprocity. At any rate, in the, during the last government, the last administration, in recent decades, the latest uh, years of uh, the uh, uh, Peronist uh, um, governments, they sort of relaxed and they got authorization to the satellite networks and this was uh, finally completed in the last two months, but the license had already been granted. For those of us in uh, uh, in uh, this business, we think that it's healthy to have competition, but we need to have, I wouldn't say restrictions, but we should have uh, some uh, balance. Uh, um, where a company that has uh, a large uh, deployment may uh, 
uh, act as a monopoly. That never happened because in in the satellite world there was always a, uh, a coexistence between the different satellites in Europe, Spain, uh, from different regions. But in the spirit of regulators, we see a trend of saying, well, somehow I need to protect not just the national services but the national industry because Argentina uh, has integrated many digital technology, satellite technologies. I don't know whether with this I'm answering your question. Well, we've run out of time. I would just leave one question, but you need to be very brief and concise. Your name? I'm Frank Peña. I'd like to know whether this new system and everything that you have talked about, Leo, <coughs> introduces some vulnerabilities we were not we didn't know in the past especially if we think of bad actors in a, a technology world that could profit of uh, what you said today that's a good question well there are two issues the first most constellations of low orbit are open networks, they, they go to the internet and the, the data vulnerability if you don't have a VPN and encryption systems by the side of the users, yes, they are vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks. There are other networks like ours, for instance, that are not open networks, they are private networks where there's an end-to-end -end encryption. That responds to a part of your question. So I th there will be, and I'm sure that uh, future constellations will have uh, proposals of value and opportunities for those that operate in private or public networks, adding the security layers will be for the benefit of end users and the next one the other one has to do with the attacks to the management systems and administration systems of these mega constellations and that is uh, less likely because everything as Elaine said everything is in standards in our case it's really to X it's a standard that is regulated and there there are data of control specifically that have all the protocols <laughs> that are encrypted and coded so that only they can be encrypted through our system so there there are several security layers precisely to prevent hacking the terminals will be geo references so as operators you won't be able to suspend services discreetly or in groups so in the case uh, in cases with terminal thefts we will be able to proceed but this was a very interesting question thank you so I'd like to now thank you three, the three of you. I really enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Before closing and before inviting you to the coffee break, let me remind you that by the end of the event, you'll be able to answer a survey. And if you enjoyed this and if you have any ideas and suggestions for events, uh, panels such as this, please let us know. Thank you. And I give the floor back to Cesar. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you very much to the members of the panels. Before you leave, I'd like to I ask you to take a picture together. And in the meantime, we'll continue with some of the activities of LACNIC 41.